Tom, what inspired you to start Douglas? Well, like a lot of people from the 50s, it was uh, Sea Hunt. Uh, <laughs> that, that was the one uh, uh, big inspiration. But before that, I used to go up to the big swimming pool there, and I grew up in Richmond, Washington. And they had a big uh, swimming pool, 12 foot deep. And one of the lifeguards periodically would uh, go down with this bell on his head with a compressor and just a, just a bucket and go down and clean off the bottom of the pool. And I used to sneak in. The pool wasn't open at the time. They were, it was earlier in the day. And I would sneak in there and just sit there and watch him. And I was just absolutely amazed at... at uh, Breathing underwater and being underwater, it just, it just uh, uh, amazed me. Um, and that, that inspired me to a degree, and Sea Hunt inspired me. But then uh, when I was 14 years old, I was working in a grocery store with my mom uh, one summer, and a couple of the guys, the older guys that were uh, real old, like they were 17, 18, 19, yeah. something like that, uh, they had read this article in a sports magazine or a outdoor magazine about some divers who had um, gone up to a lake, summer lake, spent the, uh, the week there with their families, but they were scuba diving around the marina and they were picking up stuff that people dropped and they ended up making enough money to pay for their vacations. And I thought to myself, you know, I think I think I want to be an underwater treasure hunter. <laughs> and uh, now that was in 1959. And I started becoming an underwater treasure hunter in 1959. I'm still an underwater treasure hunter, wanting to become an underwater treasure finder. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> so, well, anyway, that's what, that's what inspired me and got me going. I just love, you know, love the underwater world and aquariums and fish. And, on that. That's good. Did you have any early diving mentors? Um, mentors? Uh, I think I read the Jacques Cousteau books and um, uh, The Silent World by Jacques Cousteau. And, and I think, uh, much like you said before, that at those times, there weren't a lot of divers to go to for mentorship, but the writers that wrote about it, and of course, Lloyd Bridges and uh, Zale Perry on Sea Hunt, they were uh, quasi-mentors, I guess. Sure. But that was in the early years. Um, I'm gonna have to skip, kind of fast forward a little bit, because Spence, you know, you were my primary mentor. <laughs> Now you know that, <laughs> and still are. Um, what was early instruction and equipment like in your mind? The, um, the equipment that I started diving with was a single hose regulator. You would mentioned two hoses, but this was a, it was an Aquamatic single hose regulator um, and a galvanized scuba tank and a harness mask and fins and that was it. It was and I was diving in a rock quarry so I didn't need a weight belt. When I finally started diving with wetsuits and I had to go to a weight belt, that was the only other things that I added to that original paraphernalia. Um, and it was uh, it was pretty easy. I I've, I've uh, lived through the evolution of an awful lot of innovations. In, in diving with the pressure gauges, buoyancy compensators, dry suits, uh, and, and octopus regulators, safe seconds, whatever you want to call them. The story that I like to share as far as the evolution of some of the equipment is, I don't know what the mindset was and what the motivation was, but it some period of time, somebody decided, and I think it was John Gaffney with NASDS, uh, decided that he didn't like buddy breathing. He didn't want to buddy breathe anymore. He wanted to have 
a second regulator. Instead of buddy breathing with somebody, you take your regulator out of your mouth and, or you, you hand them a different regulator. So you have, you came up with a safe second. Right. Well, one of the manufacturers, could have been Scuba Pro, I don't know, but one of the manufacturers looked at that and said, well, we can sell more gear. So we'll just add another second stage to it. Not a problem. And uh, what do we have to do? Go to engineering. Engineering says, no problem. We just drill a hole here, tap it, thread it, you know, put a hose in there, voila, you've got it. And uh, what, what happened, however, was nobody from the engineering department talked to the educational guys to find out how are they going to teach it and what is going to be. This is a life-saving uh, emergency stress-related piece of equipment mm -hmm. and I don't know that they ever talked to anybody and said let's develop a piece of equipment that is standardized so that everybody is taught the same way to do it. It's one way and that's the way and it's standardized so that it becomes conditioned response. I kind of relate that to driving a car. Uh, you can go to any place in the world, rent a car at an airport and drive off. You could be on the left side of the road, the right side of the road, the left side of the car, the right side of the car. The accelerator and brake are always in the same relationship to each other. Any car in the world. It's always the, the accelerator and brake, because that's an automatic response. But in diving, we've got an emergency technique that is inconsistent. When you've got a, a, a second stage, an extra second stage on your regulator, uh, should you take the one out of your mouth, and give it to the buddy that wants air and then you pick the other one up and put it in your mouth and some people say no 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 you keep that in your mouth and you give this one okay what about the regulators that go on the buoyancy compensator inflators you can't give that one to them mm -hmm. and if you do you lose control of buoyancy so you have to put that one in your mouth and give them the one there so it's inconsistent that's always been a pet peeve of mine yeah. and uh, where in, in the equipment development didn't coincide with education and uh, so that's that's my pet peeve of the day. <laughs> Tom, okay. Tom, did you ever um, did you ever invent something or create something or build something in diving that you used that you either felt was a a modification or an improvement on some of the gear that you were using? Spear guns. Okay. Yeah. Took, um, uh, we, um, we would modify the, the spear guns to, instead of having two or three uh, slings, rubber slings, to propel the spear, we would modify the head and then put one big heavy uh, banana rubber, right? yeah, yeah, we used to call them, right? on there and uh, that that uh, rubber sling. And but boy, I tell you, you you had to really work at loading it. Yes, you did. Uh, but you only had one to load instead of two or three. Yeah. And that was probably it. I I made backpacks, uh, uh, Hawaiian style hook backpacks as opposed to straps. I made those, uh, but I can't think of anything else that I actually did. We uh, created ways once once we started getting more hoses for different purposes, pressure gauge, octopus regulator, uh, you know, dry suit inflator. You can have a dry suit inflator and a BC inflator, so you've got a bunch of hoses. Uh, come up with ways of configuring those hoses so that you could get out of the equipment fast. I think uh, an educational technique that I developed that I that I liked and, and I would still teach if I were teaching is uh, especially in cold water diving where we're wearing hoods 
and the face mask, if you take the mask off and try to put it back on, if you put your gloves on and you're in the water, uh, if you have a hood that's nice and tight and keeps your head warm, uh, it's hard to get that face mask back on. So what I would do, uh, and I taught this and I had my instructors teach it, is students, when you come to the pool, the first thing you do is get your face mask all rinsed out real good with soap, rinsed out so it won't fog, put your face mask on. Once you get it on and sealed and everything, now go put all your equipment together. And you did, you assembled the regulator, the BC, everything, put it in the water, put everything together with your face mask on. It was the first on, last off. Face mask comes off last. It doesn't come off and throw to the bottom of the boat for the white belt to land on. You know, you, um, and so that was one of the techniques that I, that I came up with. And it was, and it was mainly a practical thing because it, I found that it worked well for me. Yes. Well, mm -hmm.